Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Chess World Cup 2023. It's time for the quarterfinals in the open section, and it's time for the semifinals on the women's side. Incredible stuff. The quarterfinals has four of eight Indian players remaining as Vidit Gujarati yesterday in the tie breaks knocked out Jan Nipomnishi, the, the two-time World Chess Championship challenger. Vidit, Prague, Arjun Erigaisi, and Gukesh are four of the last eight men standing. This is unheard of. Completely unheard of. 50% of the field remaining is from India. Three of them can move on. Two of them have to play each other, and that's Prague and Arjun, unfortunately. Uh, I have some incredible games for you today, starting with Magnus Carlsen versus Domaraju Gukesh. That is the matchup for the future. Uh, oh my goodness, this is, th th this is really it. This is not an exaggeration either. Um, you think this is an exaggeration. Magnus Carlsen is the present and the past of chess. He has been around and the world champion for over a decade. Uh, and Gukesh is the future. Uh, Gukesh is 17 years old. He is ranked number seven in the world. Uh, and uh, he's the number one ranked Indian player now. This is it. This is his moment. Are you for real? Or are you still a young guy who has to earn his stripes, get thrown around the gym, and learn from the best? Gukesh begins the battle for the future of chess with the move d4. Knight to f6 played by Magnus. And Gukesh plays bishop to f4. Uh, which uh, I saw on Twitter. There was a fun thread by... Um, uh, this this gentleman, uh, Olympiu, I think his last name is Urkhan, but I think he it's Dilupi now. He's a historian. He's a chess historian. Uh, and he wrote, Magnus in an interview yesterday said chess is boring, so, you know, Gukesh plays the London because he wants to bore him to death. Um, B6. All right? B6. Uh, Knight C3. All right? So... This should be seven, f3. Already we got some weird stuff going on here, all right? So Magnus plays b6. He doesn't play a central pawn move. He is looking to fight against the London in, a, in an exotic way. And Gukesh responds to the fighting against the London in an exotic way with the move knight c3, which is already very exotic as well. And you'll notice that Magnus spent four minutes on the move b6. So he, he was thinking like, you know, do I, do I play a main line? What do I do? So he goes b6, knight c3, and now there's a fight for the center here and we have pawn to f3 trying to play the move e4. Now, black could just play d5 here, but for some reason, Magnus doesn't and instead plays e6 after spending another five minutes. What? He allows Gukesh to take the full center. But why would he, why would he do that? I, this is what I don't understand. Like, why not d5? Maybe he didn't like something. You know, maybe there's lines here where black gets an unpleasant position. I don't, there's some lines white can even play g4 for some reason. Uh, anyway, e6, e4. Now, another weird move. a6. What? What even is this? I don't think this has ever been played before. I mean, these two are playing some really goofy stuff. And Gukesh plays queen d2, um, not spending any time. I mean, you'll notice that Gukesh is literally not thinking. Uh, he's not, he's like, look, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna, blah, blah, maybe I should play a3, or maybe I should play e5. Like, he's just playing queen d2. Magnus plays d5 after three more minutes of thought. And now Gukesh has a moment where he should obviously spend some time, uh, because you can play e5 here, you can, you know, you can play bishop d3 maybe. He plays long castles, and he doesn't spend more than a minute. And that's losing a center pawn. Uh, Magnus has three attackers on that pawn. And Gukesh just gives it up. He gives it up in a slightly different way. Magnus goes here. Gukesh could, uh, was just intending to give up the pawn. And I think, essentially, the idea is if Magnus grabs the pawn, then black will just get a, a very passive position, and white can already begin smashing through. Because if you take the bishop, c4 wins the bishop. So Magnus plays here first. He pins the knight. Gukesh still gives up the pawn, just completely gives it away. Uh, and then plays d5. Pushing a pawn onto a square where four black pieces control it. I mean, that move is not supposed to be possible. But it's not easy for black. If you take with the bishop, the bishop is pinned. I'll take, I'll win this back, I'll rotate backwards. So taking with the bishop is probably bad. Taking with the pawn is even worse because you get the same situation. 
Uh, maybe taking with the bishop is, is worse than taking with the pawn. They're, they're around the same. Now, uh, taking with the queen, you lose the queen. Knight takes, there is queen takes g7. Oh my goodness. What is happening? I mean, you talk about a, a scrappy start to this game. These two dudes, they're fighting. They're fighting and it's the first period of hockey. Queen to f6 in like a regular season game. It's not even the playoffs, although they fight less in the playoffs. Take, take. Now, this move looks like it wins because it looks like anywhere the knight moves, you have rook d8, but black will just play defense. So instead, Gukesh pins him this way, forces a defensive move out of him, king e7, and takes his pawn. Now, I, I, I woke up this morning and I saw this position. All right, I saw Magnus play knight bd7 and I thought, okay, what's going on? One, two, three, four, five, six. First thing I do, I always count the pawns. One, two, three, four, five, six. Actually, the first thing I always do is I look if somebody's up a queen, because that's what I have to look at in your games. In these games, you know, neither side has a queen, uh, which is good because nobody can blunder one. And, and pawns are equal. Black has two knights and a bishop. Gukesh has two bishops, but it's, that's not really the full story. The full story is that black has this kind of powerful pawn. And I immediately thought, well, king is here. This king is in the center. Imbalance. Well, that definitely benefits Magnus, right? Right away. No queens. Long-term game. Slight imbalance. That's going to benefit Magnus. But Gukesh said in an interview recently, he has to and wants to improve his endgame. And he is going to take a page out of Magnus's playbook because that is what you have to learn to beat the best. And as Max Holloway says, in order to be the best, you got to beat the best. And the best is blessed. Not anymore. It's Volkanovsky. But you get the point. So Bishop G3. Gukesh brings his bishop out of the territory. Magnus plays Rook G8. Gukesh develops his bishop because he hasn't had a chance to do it yet. And if he just developed his knight, he would have lost the pawn. And you will be wondering why he's not taking. Because uh, in chess, every trade has a winner and a loser. And this one benefits black more. You can give a check, but these players don't celebrate checks like you do. That's not really... There's nothing there. And then black is just doing quite well. So bishop 2e2. And now we have take, take. And you say, Levy, you just told me he's not going to do that. Well, he's going to pin the knight to the bishop. And he's going to force a big trade. Knight takes. Pawn takes. Take, take. And if Magnus chooses to take this pawn, Gukesh is going to win that pawn. And that is exactly what happens. And Magnus moves the king off the back rank. All right, the position is completely equal. Slightly, 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 slightly better for black. Slightly. Minus 0.1. And I tweeted this morning and I said, um, I said, uh, the position, when I watch a Magnus game, when the evaluation goes to minus 0.1, I just think he's going to win. Like, I, again, I, even here, I check back in. I, I, I walk my dog. You know, my wife went to work because she has a real job. And, you know, I sit here and look at chess games all day. Um, and I thought, okay, well, well, Magnus has this position. So, of course, Magnus is playing for a win. But what's funny is if Magnus was playing white, I would say, oh, Magnus is playing for a win with white, which is a really stupid bias that I have to get rid of. Essentially, you look at the, you look at the imbalance of the pawns. First of all, black has a pass pawn. Like, that pawn has no pawn stopping its path. It's called a pass pawn. Three on two has a possibility to become a pass pawn, but it's not a, there's no pass pawns yet. And these two cancel out each other. So Magnus is going to try to do this. Also, Magnus has the better king. In, in the endgame, you, you actually want your king more involved in the center and out in the open as long as there's no queens on the board. So how is he going to do this? Well, Gukesh plays knight d4, looking for knight c6. Also, e5 is not possible. And maybe he wants rook f1 as well. Magnus puts the knight in the center, preventing knight c6. Uh, Gukesh targets the knight, obviously. And now, a fascinating decision. Magnus doesn't guard the knight. Magnus, of course, being a Gotham subscriber, what's equal or more value than a knight? A knight! So he's like, all right, let's just get rid of the knights. Now here, Gukesh can play what's called a Desperado. He can give up his knight because he's going to win it back. But Magnus would go here, so that wouldn't work. And now his king is going to guard the knight. So instead, we get just a pure rook endgame. And the rook goes back to e2. The players can shake hands and make a draw. But they can't. They can't. Magnus is still going to try. And listen, this is literally the worst situation that Gukesh could have found himself in. This is why I love comparing chess to fighting. Because in fighting, in mixed martial arts, not fake sports like boxing where you can only use your hands. Boxing's a real sport. But mixed martial arts is really the epitome of, you know, gladi modern gladiators. Um, you want to avoid a, 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 a person's preferences. Striker, Aljamain Sterling on, on, on August the 19th is fighting Sean O'Malley. All right, UFC 292. Striker versus grappler. That's what that is. 
So we have the same situation here. If you get caught in Magnus's web of endgames, the chance of you doing something stupid, even microscopically stupid, increases. He's going to beat you the longer the game goes on, okay? I'm hyping this up big time, right? He better deliver. First of all, look at this. He's threatening mate already. I'm, that's not impressive. C3. Crazy that Gukesh saw that, by the way. Very sneaky. Rook F4. The king slides up to the second rank, and Magnus targets the weakness. Rook G4, Rook G2 is the idea. Gukesh, not fearing that, plays B4. Now, if Magnus were to play Rook G4 right now, and Gukesh were to play Rook H2, Gukesh would likely lose this game in the long run. Why? Because he can't move either Rook. And Black would just very slowly encroach on the space. The only chance Gukesh has is breaking something over here. By creating an outside pass pawn, it serves as a decoy, and it frees up one of the Rooks. Also, in Rook Endgame, sometimes you can lose a pawn, but it has to be the right pawn. You can't lose this pawn and give Black a 2 on 0. You could lose one of these pawns, maybe, and then maybe it would be a draw. So B4, Magnus shuts that down and then targets this. And Gukesh doesn't play passively. He counterattacks, forcing Magnus to do this, and now we have a one rook endgame. Now, it's very difficult to make a draw here with white, because Magnus's plan is very simple. Walk down the center of the board. He's going to get the pawns here, he's going to trade, and he's going to promote. He's just going to win. So what do you do if you're playing with white? So A4. Magnus ignores you completely and plays the move F5. That was always his plan. Gukesh plays, pawn takes B5. Pawn takes B5, and rook A2, very natural. He's utilizing the open file. Gukesh has done absolutely nothing wrong. Nothing, except he's losing. What? But it says minus 0.5. It doesn't know. Deep depth stockfish already senses danger for white. He's losing. He has to... Gukesh is now walking on a tightrope against Magnus Carlsen. Magnus is the director of the circus. Gukesh is walking on the tightrope. He makes it to the end, he gets the prize, which is a draw. This is ridiculous. You don't even realize how hard this is. The computer doesn't even realize how hard this is. There is a drawing mechanism here for white. C4, rook g3 check, and you, you, you actually volunteer this pawn for capture, and you just invest in your b-pawn. I mean, it's ridiculous stuff. Who plays chess like this? But what I'm about to show you is even more ridiculous. Rook a2, Magnus plays rook g5, ready to play f4 and defend the pawn like this. And now rook to a5. Pawn to f4 is the winning, is, is the drawing idea. And now the otherworldly king c2! You induce the pawn forward. You walk into a check, but you get your king closer to the pawns. So now, black has to go back and guard. You go here, here, and now you don't go here. You give a check. What does it look like you've accomplished? And now you go here. Because now, if e5, rook a6, and then rook e6, and black cannot move a single piece. That was the only way that Gukesh could make a draw in this game. Instead, Gukesh went here. And now here comes Magnus. Here comes Magnus, here comes Magnus, here comes Magnus, and Magnus, I told you that was the plan all along. Gukesh missed a psychotic. If Gukesh found that, they, 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 there has to be a scan of his backside on the way out of the room. I mean, I'm sorry, you gotta scan everything. He doesn't find it. Look at how frozen White's position is. White's position being a draw was an illusion the whole time. All the way back here. It was an illusion. Magnus knew the way to play it forward. Gukesh stumbled into Magnus' strength. You can't do that. Look, I mean, the position is literally zeros, but it's not. It's only zeros if you find it on an otherworldly level of depth and find the defensive mechanism. I'm not even sure Gukesh made a mistake. He had to find this absurd defense and it takes 48 moves of just hydraulic press and Magnus Carlsen wins. Gukesh resigns because rookie eight, king d3, this is coming. The shield, you can't stop it. I'm gonna walk in here and I've got two pawns that are gonna promote. Magnus beats Gukesh with black. The future of chess will have to wait because Magnus was in vintage form. You cannot beat this Magnus Carlsen. Can't beat him, can't, there's nothing you can do. Did he play a perfect game by the way? I haven't actually checked game review yet. I'm gonna check game review live right now. What was his accuracy? 98% estimated ELO, 3600. What do you even want from this man? I mean, like seriously, did he even, you know where his mistakes were? His mistakes were probably in the opening. Bishop to b4 is considered an inaccuracy. 
Rook g5 a little bit later. Magnus had to find, I think he had to play king f6. I mean, like, he had to play. I mean, just, it's, 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 it's actually sick. You, you know who else is contending for the, for the future of chess? Arjun Eregaisi and Prague. These guys are friends. My friends, this is, um, this is, this is really an unfortunate one. Uh, these guys are literally like roommates at the tournament. Imagine going to the World Cup in Baku, hanging out with a friend for the entire tournament, both making it to the quarterfinals to represent the hottest country in the world of chess right now. Not climate, although that's a separate issue that we'll discuss that some people don't even believe exists. Um, chess in India is red hot, and these two are playing in the quarterfinals while also taking walks at night together, which is um, sad. I would like to see them playing other people. Knight f3, all right? The battle of the friends. It's an anime plot line. One of the two Indians will knock the other out of the World Cup, but that means one of them will qualify to the semifinals and probably make it to the candidates. One of the two people that wins this matchup is literally going to the candidates. That's crazy. Maybe, like 90% chance. They play a symmetrical, this is called like a Neo Grunfeld. You don't have to know the name. You're not gonna remember it anyway. Knight d7, none of this matters. They play a very sophisticated opening. And this is the position after the first 13 moves, everything is good. They've traded C pawns. Black has advanced over here. Could it be an asset? Could it be a liability? Questions that we have to ask ourselves. Um, Rook A5. Oh, my neck is stiff. I, uh, I got back into mixed martial arts training. I uh, took some time off. I got COVID back in December, so I took like six months off the gym. But recently, I've gotten back to personal training, and uh, I've gone back to boxing and judo. Uh, and... Uh, it's good. I'm, I'm just very tired. I haven't showered yet either. I came home from training and I'm recording the recap. Um, but uh, my neck is stiff. Take, take. Anyway, doesn't matter. No A pawn, no C pawn, symmetrical position. Uh, Arjun seizes the A file. He just says, you know, Prague, you're my roommate, but I'm, I'm getting that side. E3, Rook C8. I have no evidence, by the way, that they're roommates or not, but they're very good friends and they're obviously hanging out in the tournament a lot. Uh, now, uh, an interesting moment. Eregaisi gives up the bishop for the knight. Under traditional circumstances, this is stupid. He is not stupid. Uh, I mean, in chess. I, maybe he doesn't know how to tie his shoes. I don't know. Arjun, if you're watching this, I think you're great. E6. Um, six pawns on light squares. He just traded his light squared bishop. He puts six pawns on light squares. That makes a lot of sense because the light squared bishop covers the light squares. He now has a brick wall of a position. Rook D1. Bishop F8. Both guys are bringing their bishops back into the game. And Arjun is very clearly dominating and trying to force something to happen on the queen side. Take, take. Rook C8. Things are falling off the board. Bishop e5 and take, take. And in all likelihood, we are headed for some sort of draw. But we do have a slight imbalance of bishop versus knight and potential pawn structure. b5. And suddenly, Eric Geisy in low time, sensing weakness, plays d4. And now, a very, very, very difficult moment. Um, if you take with the pawn, Eric is going to put his knight here. And this is very scary. Knights are very scary. So he goes here, thinking the knight has to leave. It doesn't. The knight just goes straight in. Just absolutely flies off the cliff. He gives up a knight for literally a pawn. A pawn! That's it. One pawn. But in chess, there's two important things. Material and king safety. And now the king is weak. Queen b6 is coming. Queen d2 is coming. Queen g5 is coming. The pawn is coming. Arjun is coming. This is a very, very difficult position for white. Bishop to g2, and Prague blunders with 40 seconds on the clock. He actually played this move with 10 seconds on the clock because he gets 30 seconds back, I think. Um, he had to play king h1, sidestepping this check because rook c8 is a checkmate threat. So he plays this, and he makes it to the 40th move. But look at the position. White is stuck in a corner of the board. And my friends, unfortunately, it never really gets any better. Eric Icy just very patiently waits for the right moment he brings his king forward, literally walks into the position. Like, uh, who was that Belgian king, King Albert, who walked, who was like, uh, he would walk with the soldiers. He walks with the soldiers, sacrificing the rook to promote the pawn. And uh, this reminded me, this scene where he manages to promote like this, and then this, this reminded me of, uh, of the scene in Harry Potter. Like, if something like this, there's a scene in Harry Potter in the Deathly Hallows, where they fall on the ground after Nagini gets cut with the sword. And then it's like they just stare at each other. It's just kings and pawns. But black is completely winning because black is in white's position. So black has much quicker access to the pawns. And black is going to win the pawns. 
and uh, white is simply going to run out of moves. I mean, you can you just you you cannot defend the pawns anymore. Um, so uh, Eregaisi wins. Eregaisi beats Prague, which is crazy. That is a crazy result. Eregaisi the winner, um, and Prague now has to win with black, just like just like uh, just like Gukesh. Would you rather play in a must-win situation against Erigaisi or Carlson? I mean, no disrespect to Arjun, but I think people would choose him. <laughs> the alternative is the best player of all time. Uh, but listen, Arjun in great shape right now to make the semis and probably make the candidates. Uh, one more game. Uh, no, no, no. Well, just we're going to keep rolling. Friends, this was a crazy game. This was a heartbreaking game. Uh, Ledope, the man with the greatest nickname in chess. Also, Lanier Dominguez Perez is one of the most underappreciated super GMs of all time. He hasn't really won any flashy event. He's won a few things. He's been 2750 for like 15 years before he transferred to the United States. I'm not even sure you knew of him, which was like five or seven years ago. He was Cuba. He played for Cuba. He's, he's Cuban. This is 2750. He's just in the quarterfinals. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. He plays for the Olympic team. And, and I got news for you. In this game, he, he took on the preparation of Fabiano Caruana. He was down 28 minutes on the clock in an E45 game. Fabi traded light squared bishops. Fabi thought for the first time 15 moves into the game. This is just vintage Fabi stuff. There's just like nothing you can do about it, you know? Queen D7, take, take. And Fabi played D5 and he, and he sees the center of the board. This is like exactly what Fabiano Caruana does to people. It doesn't matter what their level is. He's got prep all up and down. He will drag you up and down the chessboard. He closed the center. He undeveloped his knight, clearly looking for hostilities on this side of the board. But Lanier was patient. All right? He was patient. He took the A file. All right? He traded rooks and, 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 and basically offered Fabi this pawn. Fabi doesn't have to take the pawn. Taking the pawn could potentially cause infiltration here, could weaken this over here. Fabi thinks for a while, takes the pawn, decides Lanier is full of, full, full of crap. He's got nothing. He's got absolutely nothing. I'll just bring, bring my queen. I'm up a pawn. But suddenly the pawns for black start looking delicate. Like I'm talking real delicate. Only black is playing for a win. This, this, and this are all only white is playing for a win. Black's pawns are weak. Now Fabi had to be active. He had to give up the pawn, target this, and be active on the A file and try to use the B pawn. Fabi played passively, and all of a sudden, Fabi is dead lost. He's down two pawns. This is resignable territory. This is like, I mean, this, this really, I'm not exaggerating. Look at this position. Two pass pawns. Now he's only, he, he's only down one pawn, but two pass pawns. And like, you know, black, if black plays rook c3, I just go d6. You take that, I got d7. I just win. You can't do anything. Fabiano is dead lost against Lanier, the most underappreciated 2700 ever. This is, this is ridiculous. Fabiano is one of the favorites remaining besides Magnus to win the whole thing. Out of nowhere, Lanier is putting the hurt on him. Rook, he's just going to queen. Nobody could have seen this coming. Rook b7, advancing the pawn. Rook c3, counterattacking. He just grabbed, he's just up two pawns. Just pure two pawns. It's not even close. Rook to d3. Lanier seals the deal. Here comes Fabi trying to defend himself. And here Lanier had to bring his king. He moved with his knight. And that gave Fabi a little bit of life. The, the white king did not want to stand over here. The white king needed to be a bit more active. Suddenly Fabi got active. But also, but also defensive. And preventing white from making any progress. How does white make progress here? Can white make progress here? This is insane. Lanier now gives up a pawn. Knight e2, he's trying to seal out the rook, but here comes Fabi with side checks, with front checks. Lanier runs the king, but knight d7. Oh my god. Is Fabi going to save this game? Knight e5, king b5, g5, h5. Fabi, that's it. Fabi stopped the pawn. Two pawns down in a rook and knight endgame. This is otherworldly defense. Lanier sacrifices his pawn and gets this one. But now, rook e4. And an absolutely Herculean effort. This is not, this cannot be understated, my friends. It was over. He was down two pawns. It was like plus four in deep analysis. And Lanier chooses the wrong plan right at the very end. And Fabi pulls off a miracle and draws the game. He was on the verge. He was going to lose. Saving the game. This is going to give him so much momentum, Fabiano fans. Y'all can rejoice because this was...
Unbelievable. Uh, another game that was very fun. This is on the women's side. They're in the semifinals. The other matchup ended in a draw. This was a Queen's Gambit decline from Tan Zhong Yi uh, of China. They have a ridiculously stacked team, by the way. They have Lei Ting Jie, they have Ju and Jun, Tan Zhong Yi. Uh, this was uh, awesome stuff. Vintage uh, Queen's Gambit decline stuff here. White is trying to get a big center. Black fighting back on the Queen side. We have trades of bishops. And White has. Uh, this type of position. Now you'll notice here, this move, h5 from Garyachkina trying to prevent white from expanding. White chooses the wrong plan. Clearly, white was building up something over here, which is what you're supposed to build up in the Queen's Gambit decline, but then should have continued to build here or play knight c5. White chooses this plan and all of a sudden, queen b8, the lighthouse from far away, right? Hitting things. Computer preferred here for black to play some obscure knight g7. I mean, I don't even know. Queen b8. And Garyachkina took over the game on the queen side. White tried to stabilize. Black just made some casual improving moves. We went to a queenless endgame. c5. Lashing out, creating a weakness, but a potential long-term infiltration spot. Take, 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 take. d4. Tough decision. Be gluttonous and allow infiltration if you do this. Rook c2. This is very, very delicate stuff now over here. There's crazy tactics. Bishop g5, bishop e3, infiltrating on the dark squares. White goes here, but now this is a passer. And Garyachkina is just... She found a way in. And a way in she is going to get. Bishop g5 from all angles. h4! Prying away the defense. Rook d4. Rook c1 check, and the pawn has fallen. And this is all you're going to need if you're black. All right, white tries to create some counterplay, but unfortunately, it's just not good enough. You can take a pawn with check, but you can't stop a pawn promotion. F4, pawn takes, and it takes 45 moves. Look at this seal, by the way. Bishop to b4, you can take the bishop, but then I promote, and it's, uh, it's game over. You get ladder mated, basically. Knight takes, king g8, and that's it. The pawn is going to queen. Garyachkina winning a very nice game, punctuated with this move, h4. It seemed like White had stabilized, but it was all an illusion, just like the Magnus game. And Garyachkina takes a one to nothing lead in her match. And this is the last game of the day. We go back to the open side. This was also another game that was crazy, like an absolutely absurd back and forth fight. This is Vidit Gujarati, the fourth Indian remaining in the field of eight versus Nijad Abasov, who is playing from, uh, from Azerbaijan, the hometown hero. Vidit, I mean, this was a spicy game. There was knights dancing all over the board in the opening, putting it... Nice and in the center. Take, take. Black has a miserable and ugly structure, but he's going to use dynamics. He's going to try to get rid of the pawn. He's going to try to be active with his pawns like this. Vidit can take on c6. But then queen e7 and bishop b7 and black is firing back. So Vidit doesn't take the pawn. For now. Maybe he's not going to take it at all. Knight c4, take, take. Vidit has a slightly better position here from the opening. You'll notice black has spent no time. 128 on the clock. Queen h6 threatens the pawn. Queen g6. I mean, Nijad is not even thinking. Now he plays h5. That's his first time thinking in the entire game. And the position finally clarifies. After 25 moves, we have the following position. This is one of the ugliest positions I have ever seen in my life. I don't know why anybody, anywhere, anytime, any ELO would volunteer themselves for this. This is the, this is the, the, like the equivalent of getting a root canal at the chessboard. Okay? This is the equivalent of getting a colonoscopy at the chessboard. All right? This is like a very unpleasant medical exam. Black has, when I say zero, that is not an exaggeration. Black has negative chance of winning this game. Negative. Every pawn is frozen. White has four pawns on light squares that create an impregnable setup over here. Black has to stay guarding both of these stupid pawns. With best play, black will make a draw. But Vidit is going to try and make so many headaches. Bishop h6. Bishop back. At some point, he's going to play g4. Some point is now. Five pawns for white on light squares. Look how amazing his posi position is. Black can't infiltrate. Black can't move anything. All black can do here is sit and wait. And Vidit is going to just pose questions. At some point, he might trade the rooks. He might trade the bishops. Is he winning in one of these endgames? I don't know. Here he goes. All right. It looks like black has, you know, found oh, 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 oh. Is Vidit going to find... Have they repeated moves yet? No. Is he going to play a4 at some point? Vidit trying. He's trying. Is he making any progress? All right. Maybe. Oh, oh, oh. Is the rook getting caught? Maybe not. 
All right. Oh, oh, oh. Black spawns are on the move. Black spawns are on the move. Now it's in a rook end game. King e4. Oh, Vidit's one upon, but here comes counterplay. Material and king safety, right? Now, Black's king is very active. You don't want to trade the rooks here. You don't want to trade the rooks. King and pawn end game is a loss, but somehow white can't make progress because white's extra pawn is over here. So it's just stuck. Despite how absolutely stupid Black's pawns are, and now all the pawns are falling, White is going to win a few pawns and try to advance the G-pawn. Vidit is close. He's close. He's so close, but Black comes back and plays defense and creates counterplay of his own, and... Oh! Now Vidit is down a pawn, but he does get in, and the players agree to a draw after 109 moves. There was like some very limited moments in this game, I think, early, where Vidit could have pressed, and the computer actually showed a very big advantage, but I don't know if it was misunderstanding the fortress. Like I said, Black had no chance to win this game. Vidit pushed forever. So Vidit and Fabi make draws against their respective opponents. Kukesh and Prague now have to win with Black or their World Cup is over. The future of chess will resume tomorrow. Get out of here.